do you think the Court of Appeals got it right? No. I believe that the decision erodes uh, an attorney's duty to their client, and I believe that it erodes uh, public trust in the legal profession. I do think the Court of Appeals got it right. It was a fascinating case, uh, but at its core was the uh, principle uh, of law in North Carolina that uh, provides that uh, the doctrine of contributory negligence applies to negligence actions in our state. Uh, a legal malpractice case is by definition a negligence case in North Carolina. Uh, our courts have consistently indicated that uh, that contributory negligence does apply to a legal malpractice case. The Court of Appeals decision highlights the absence of any suggestion that the plaintiffs would not have understood the provision if they had read it. Do you think it would have changed the outcome if the facts showed that the plaintiffs could not understand the lease? I don't think it would have changed the outcome. When I read the opinion, I see the Court of Appeals creating uh, a very hard rule uh, regarding whether or not someone reads their contract, despite having hired an attorney to do that. So the rule now is that an attorney cannot be held responsible uh, if the client did not read the contract. I think that's a good question. Uh, it, it would not have changed the duty of the plaintiffs to read the lease. Uh, in, in North Carolina, as I indicated before, uh, I think the law is crystal clear that a party signing a lease has an absolute independent obligation uh, to read that lease. Uh, and having read it and chosen to sign it is bound by the lease or the contract, uh, as the case may be. How should the complexity of the underlying agreement affect the client's duty to read the agreement? The complexity of the agreement uh, should uh, be one factor in uh, deciding what duty a client has to read an agreement, but it should be a factual determination by a finder of fact and not the court. So another interesting question, uh, the, the short answer is no, because the law is clear that a party signing an agreement has an obligation to read that document. Uh, that's an absolute duty on the part of anyone who signs a contract who later brings an action uh, arising out of the contract. So the duty to read it, I think, is clear. How should the sophistication of the client affect the client's duty to read the agreement? Certainly, sophistication of the client should, have, should be one of the factual determinations uh, in deciding whether or not there's contributory negligence, but again, that is a, should be a factual determination. The court in our case did point out uh, the sophistication of the parties. In this case, the plaintiffs uh, were a number of LLCs that were, and the LLC members were sophisticated business persons who had uh, been engaged in the development of, in this case, CVS sites uh, all over the southeast. and. Uh, had a considerable business experience and sophistication, and that uh, was something that the court deemed worthy of note. Do you believe an email directing the client to please review and provide me with any comments should have been sufficient to support the finding of contributory negligence? Well, in this case, apparently it was sufficient, uh, but uh, the, the court uh, did not mention in their uh, opinion that that very email also mentioned uh, three items that were uh, different than the model lease that the parties had long ago agreed uh, to use as their lease. It mentioned parking spaces, and it mentioned the change in rent amount and the change in a date of delivery. And it is hard for me to understand how, if those three items uh, were important, a new provision that had never been inserted into any lease um, that these clients had ever executed with this attorney that shifted tax responsibility thousands of dollars per year was not material to mention. My answer to that, not surprisingly, is yes. Uh, and it clearly uh, was sufficient from the Court of Appeals perspective and in the Court of Appeals decision, the fact that that there had been specific email instruction to all three members of these LLCs to review these lease agreements and to provide feedback to counsel uh, was particularly important uh, to the court uh, in, in its decision 
And it was important to us in our argument of the case uh, in the Court of Appeals because we thought that uh, uh, that it gave us really almost two bites of the apple on the contrib issue. Uh, first, the uh, existence of North Carolina law that placed the duty on the parties to read the agreement that we've discussed before. And secondly, we contended uh, a, a conscious decision on the part of these plaintiffs in this case to ignore advice of counsel to uh, to read the leases. Everybody acknowledged that they received these emails, all three. There was no question that they weren't sent. There was no question that they weren't received. What do you think was the best fact to support your client's theory of liability? The best facts in this case to support liability is the admission by the attorney that there was a model lease uh, that was used and the admission that if there were material changes uh, suggested or demanded by another party um, and he would notify his clients. What do you think was the best fact to support your client's defense of contributory negligence? Interestingly, having discussed this emails before, I think the single, the single best fact we had uh, were, were the email communications to the clients in each and every situation requesting the clients to read and comment about the lease. 